Amen. In our scripture today, Paul writes for us Ephesians 4.1. We've already kind of looked at this in the, the, the scheme of things as we've gone through this sermon series. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord. He's in, he's in chains at this point. He says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you've been called by God. So our whole idea is, is finding our purpose and living our destiny. And, and God's the God of purpose. And, and in the midst of that, uh, God has called us and invited us to join in his purpose for this world. And it's a privilege to join Jesus in his mission and that purpose for us. And in the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at, I guess, what I call the five components of God's call to help us see that call, that invitation in our life, and help us step into it. And in those, out of those five components, the first one was that it comes from God. It's important to remember that. It literally comes from God to us. It doesn't come from somebody else, from God to us. And that carries a heavy weight of, of stewardship with it, if, if you ask me. I mean, it, God says, I'm asking you to join me giving you this invitation, this calling to step in and join me in this purpose. And, and it's probably not good to go, eh, no thanks, God, but thanks for asking. You know, it's probably good to say, I, I need to be a part of this and make this real. And the second one we looked at is it's, it's about that passion that God put us th- within us. It's that we're compelled to do the things that God wants us to do. And then the third one, which was maybe the most important one, is that it involves our entire life. As we consecrate ourselves to God, which means to give ourselves fully over to God, then we are open and available for God to be at work within us and for God to give us the assignments to carry out that we need to do. The fourth part was about God's power. We work work hard, blood, sweat, and tears, and yet it's God's power at work in us that carries this thing to completion. We're not going to do it under our own power and finally, the fifth one was just seeing the beauty, and I just called it this, it was uh, that it, it, it's, it's our lifetime tapestry, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything that's in there. God somehow weaves that thing into this beautiful thing and says, here's what you are, and here's what I want you to do. And as we look at our lifetime tapestry and everything from our past and, and our present, we can see maybe where God is leading us. Now, this week, we're, we're looking at back at Ephesians 4.1, and here's just what Paul tells us, and it's important to remember this. He says, live a life worthy of the calling that you have received from God. Worthy of that calling. See, the key word here is the word worthy in the original language, axios, is what it is, and it really means weight or scales or balance. See, what what he's saying is our daily living should match or should correspond to the high position that we've been called to as the children of God. Our practical living should match our spiritual position. There should be a balance in the midst of that. That's how it's worthy. If it's such an amazing and powerful thing that God has done for us and giving us this calling and literally calling that, that he gives us his grace and his love that we might be a child of God and then a calling to carry out his purpose, then at the same time, to be worthy, we have to do a lot to make that real and to carry that thing to completion. So you and I have been called and invited to be active participants in God's kingdom advancement and in sharing Jesus. There's no way around that. Live worthy of the calling. So this week, I'm going to start taking a look at what I would call common pitfalls to carrying out our, our calling, our, our purpose, what we are asked to do. Common pitfalls that keep us from living worthy of that calling. Cautions, maybe you would say, and and how these things can keep us from doing the things that we've been called to do. And the first one is this. I called it noble detours. I picked these words important, okay? Noble detours. It's easy to get overwhelmed with the size and the scope of the mission that God has given us and, and to see all the need that is out there within the world. And we think we have to be everything for everybody. We can't. It's impossible. You cannot take care of all the needs of the world. So what part is God calling you to? Be faithful to that. And you have to trust that God's going to bring the, raise the people up to carry out the other things that need to be done. See how that makes, begins to make sense? Noble detours can't get sidetracked by a noble detour and miss our part. Notice I use the word noble because it's good. It's needed, but it's not for you to do. It's for someone else. We must know our assignment and our calling and stay focused to it. 
Now, the scripture I use for this is Luke 4, 42 to 44. It's also found in Mark uh, chapter 1, like verse 35, somewhere in there. And what's happening is Jesus has just begun his ministry. Great things are happening in this city, in this town called Capernaum. This is kind of like a local hometown area. It's like, kind of like the local church. It's kind of this area for Jesus. And man, he's doing great things there. We find out that there's healing taking place. Lives are being changed. Demons are being cast. All this amazing stuff is happening. And Jesus, one time, sneaks out into the dark okay and he's praying and he's making this connection with God as he always does and and everybody's looking for him because all this good ministry is happening finally Peter finds him and says Jesus we got to get back here to Capernaum and do this ministry and Jesus says no see my calling is I need to go to other places and spread this word elsewhere as well you see it would have been a noble detour yeah good stuff needed stuff to go back to Capernaum and just keep ministering there but guess what he knew he was called to something else he had to say no to the noble detour and do what he had to do okay does that make sense what Jesus said to understand even though it's a good thing it's a noble thing you can't not do it the same thing was that we've been studying Romans 15 with Paul in verses 20 to 22 or so, Paul says this, very interesting. He says, it's always been my ambition to share Jesus with people who really have never heard of Jesus before. That's the thing that's my ambition. Now, I do go and I share with, with people who've already heard about Jesus. They started churches and, and small groups and they meet in homes and I, I'm there as well. But you see, my passion, the one thing I know I'm called to do is to go and share with people who've never heard of Jesus before. And he says this word, he says, this is why I am delayed in coming to visit you. See, it's a good thing to go visit you. I want to go visit you. Great stuff would happen if I would come and visit you, but I can't do it because I know what I'm called to do and I have to go do it. See, noble detours, I guarantee you, will keep you from reaching your destination. All right? Noble detours. The second one I called, administrative barnacles. Oops, there they are. Barnacles, aren't they pretty? Not really. Barnacles, you know what they are. They get up on the hole, the bottom hole of a ship. Ships are designed to cut through the water. When these things get attached to them, bad things happen. I did a little research and found out that these things attach to the holes of the ships. They collect in this big collective mass and it slows boats dramatically, even up to half speed of what they can go because of barnacles there. Think about that. They can make ships burn 40% more fuel just to get going from what they should have. In fact, I read, interestingly enough, the U.S. Navy spends an additional $500 million a year in extra fuel and, and work to try and clean off barnacles. That's, that's a lot. See, barnacles, what they do is they get a hold of things, and they get on there, and they slow everything down. They bog everything down, and they keep it from moving forward. Now, here's the story I'm giving you. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Interesting thing is happening. The church is growing exponentially. We need to get back to that, folks. The church is growing exponentially. Not, oh, every once in a while uh, we add one person here or add one person there. I mean, they're talking when the church got started, man, exponentially things were happening. Everywhere people were coming to Jesus and to the kingdom of God. Okay? So this is a great thing that's happening, but it creates a problem because they started getting large. And the problem became kind of an administrative problem, and it was a logistical problem, but it was also a spiritual problem as well. Here's what it is. They have widows that they're caring for. The Greek widows are always taking second place to the Hebrew widows. So when it comes time for daily food distribution, you see the Hebrew widows always get the food, and then if there's any left over, the Greek widows get it. You see what the problem is? It's a spiritual problem, but it's also a logistical problem, and an administrative problem. They're getting too big. They don't know what to do. Now, can I just say this as well? Notice that every time the church, wherever the church is, wherever God's people are, it is always about taking care of those in need and the vulnerable. Are you hearing me? Okay. That has to be a part every time of the ministry that we're doing. So it's, a, it's an important problem because for the Greek widows, it could be life or death. <laughs> 
So the apostles, the leadership, they step in and they say, <clears throat> we cannot neglect our calling. We understand where we're supposed to go here of, of the word and, and of prayer for even a noble detour of administrating food distribution. We, we can't do that. You see, they're going to be slowed down, bogged down, keeps them from their calling and their purpose. So what they do is they say, find capable persons to carry out this ministry. These persons, their assignment is their calling. And as others come and find their place, as others step up into the ministry that's there because it's getting too big, they join in and they become active participants in God's kingdom advancement. And you know what it tells us? The church continued to grow exponentially, ever-widening circles. People were finding their place, actively participating in God's kingdom advancement. They were sharing Jesus, and things were happening. And I can just tell you this, and I, I, I don't want to take a lot of time on this, but man, churches, especially just like mainline churches in America, okay, here we are, um, they have this thing, and they call it the 200-person ceiling. And here's why. Uh, a, a, a pastor can be... What some people see as the pastor's job um, is to kind of just be the chaplain to make sure everybody's happy and take care of people and do that kind of thing. You can do that for up to about 100, 120 people, and that's it. You're done. See, what happens is people expect that from a pastor. Pastors try and live that, and all of a sudden, whoa, we're growing, we're growing. There's over 200 people. There's no way you can possibly meet the needs or minister to those kinds of persons in a, in a way that's effective. So what happens is if, the, if we don't change the structure of the church, if the pastor doesn't change how they do things, if new people don't step in and start carrying out different ministries so the pastor can be set free from them, it, the number just comes right back down, and you never get past that 200. Does that make sense? So... so this is where so many churches are in America. We have got to learn to, to say, here's my job as a pastor, what I'm going to do. Other people have to step into their parts and say, we're going to fill in all these gaps. And you know what happens? The church continues to grow. But if you don't, the church will not continue to grow because you're not meeting the structure or the needs of anybody that's there. So I don't want to waste too much time on that, but here's what I do want to say is this. You're not to-do list is just as important as your to-do list. Everybody hear that? Your not to-do list is just as important as your to-do list. Albert Hubbard put it this way. I love the way he says this. He says this, the art, um, art is a process of elimination. You see, the sculptor produces this beautiful statue by chipping away such parts of the marble block that are not needed. You see how that works? A big old marble block there. He's able to look at it, or she's able to look at it, and they can chip away everything else and make this beautiful statue out of it. See, art is a process of elimination, of knowing what you shouldn't be doing so that you can find out what you should be doing. That's who we are. That's who we're called to be. That's who we are as a church as well. So number one, noble detours, they're great, but they stop you from getting to your true destination of where you're supposed to go. Number two, these barnacles, they will slow you down and put you in the wrong areas. Number three, I called it solo ownership, and it, so many churches just kind of look like this right here. They're just little silos, everybody individually doing their own little thing, never connecting, never having ministry together. It's always just everybody's little thing, little piece together. Here's what we find, Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 16. Jesus had many, many followers. And one night, Jesus goes out, and he spends the entire night in prayer. Everybody hear that? <laughs> I mean, when's the last time we spent the entire night in prayer? Jesus didn't want to get this wrong. He spends the entire night in prayer, and he comes back the next morning, and he chooses out 12 persons to be his apostles. Now, here's what he does. For the rest of his life on earth, these next three years of ministry that he's going to be involved in, he pours his life into those 12 persons. Because he knows, I can't do this alone. I mean, Jesus could run around and, and try and help one person individually all day, every day, until he died. But that wasn't going to do it. He says, I can't do this alone. We're never called to do this alone. So he pours his life into 12 people. Really, there's about 120 people that are really following Jesus at the time of his death. And, and when the Holy Spirit comes, uh, and they're all in that upper room together. 
And even more than that, probably about three, Peter, James, and John. He even specifically spends more time with them. Why? Because he's training them. He's working with them. And everywhere that Jesus went and everywhere that Jesus ministered, they were with him learning and helping and being trained. And he never sent them out one by one. He always sent them out two by two because he knew you could never do it alone. Even the early church, over and over and over, we find out the early church never allowed solo leadership or ownership. They always sent people out in groups. Those missionary journeys were always more than one person. Sometimes it was three and, and four. Always a group effort. See, it's so easy to fall into this solo ownership thing. And I'm telling you, far too many persons are willing to let others be and do it alone as well. But we can't. This is why I truly believe in team ministry. This is where strength and support come. This is literally where the sharing of the burden comes. And as we talk about where we're moving as a church and where we're going, and this is another big thing we're figuring out this summer, is what we're going to be doing. And, and, and the, the focus is, again, it's going to be on children, youth, and families and how we're going to get to that point. But when we do so, it's about teams of persons working there. It's not about individuals. We're not going to go, oh, let's go hire somebody. They can do it. And then, whew, we can all sit down and go, man, I finally got somebody to work with them. That's not what it's about. It's about teams of persons working together to make this happen. We're going to be doing small group ministries. It's about teams of persons making that happen. Because literally, Jesus in the early church model is small groups for learning and training and growing. It's mentoring one-on-one -on -one or maybe one-on-two -on -two or three and helping people. And it's always, always ministry teams. You see, noble detours send you the wrong way. Administrative barnacles keep you from going where you should go. Solo ownership will keep you from being able to accomplish what you need to accomplish because it's always about more than one. But this, last, this fourth one here is really the, the big one. Everybody ready? I didn't know what else to call it, so I called it earth stuff. How's that? In stuff, a wonderful word. There's a quote on there from a, a group called The Call. It says, all you hold on to is all that holds on to you. Think about that. Luke chapter 12, one of the greatest passages in Luke. Man, Jesus just shares so much in the midst of this. In Luke chapter 12, verses about 13 to 34, amazing stuff is happening. He tells this parable. He says there's this farmer, and he had just a bumper crop, and there was so much goodness there. And, and what he did instead of going, here, let's help people and share with people, he said, ah, I'm going to build, tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and I'm going to store it in there and say, I don't have to do anything the rest of my life because we've got all this stockpile, and man, everything is great. And then God says, you fool. This very night, your life, your soul's demanded from you. What, what's going to happen with all that? What did you do with it? But just hoard it and keep it. And so Jesus says, a person is a fool who stores up earthly stuff and wealth, but does not have a rich relationship with God. And then he makes this amazing statement. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Your heart always stays connected to your treasure. Your treasure will keep your heart's focus every time. Okay, everybody hearing this? Always. It keeps your heart's focus because it demands your allegiance and your loyalty and your devotion. If earth stuff is your treasure, everybody hearing me? If earth stuff is your treasure, if it's your focus, then your allegiance and your devotion is going to stay with it. Jesus says, don't worry about this stuff here on the earth. You need to seek first God and God's kingdom, which is the true eternal life. And then you can give your allegiance and your focus and your loyalty and your devotion to God's kingdom. See, earth stuff consists of lots of things like our resources and our possessions and our time and our comfort and our recreation and our perception of what life is supposed to be like, you know, that American dream. And we're supposed to have this size house and we're supposed to have two vehicles and we're supposed to have a boat. And we're supposed to have two children, one boy and one girl, and then there's supposed to be like 1.5 1. dogs, I think, every, every family has or something in the backyard. However it works out, this is, this is what it's supposed to be. Nah. That's not the thing we're supposed to live for. Jesus says, you are to live worthy of your calling as a child of God, and this means that you are to make God and the kingdom of God your primary concern in life. 
And as you do so, the rest of everything in life here falls into place. It might be second place, but it falls into place. Seek first the kingdom and all this other stuff is added to it. C.S. Lewis spoke so perfectly. I've given you this quote before. He says, when you put first things first, second things, everything else isn't diminished or decreased, but it's increased because it's put exactly where it's supposed to be. You see, when we start putting other things in place of God, earth stuff, even good stuff, our families and everything else, when we put that in place of God as first and then we put God down here somewhere, you see what you're truly doing because you're taking it out of context of how God has designed it to be, you're decreasing it. But when you put God first, it increases it. It seems counterintuitive, but it's the reality of life. And if we could just let go of earth stuff and say, God, right here, I'm giving everything to you and to your kingdom. You are first no matter what. You are my primary concern in every aspect. Everything else in life is lifted up with it. See how that works? It's a beautiful picture. And that's what Jesus tells us. Earth stuff. Finally, the last thing that can keep you from where you need to be in ministry. I just called it ministry discouragement. See, when you get involved in ministry and you start living your calling in life, here's where we are. You ready for this? You're going to get let down. You're going to feel betrayed at some point. You're going to have times of fatigue and grow weary. You're going to have times where you feel completely alone. There are going to be times where things don't go the way that you wanted them to. There are going to be times where you're going to be disappointed. There are times where you're going to be disillusioned. Disillusioned because of of persons or or conflicts or, or issues. And some people, I'm guaranteeing you, are just going to make you mad as a hornet. Anybody ready? Going to make you mad as a hornet. That's how it is. Being honest, living out your calling is not for the weak. In fact, uh, I don't even know if I'll go into it, but in the last few decades, it feels like the church just seems to be in a point of discouragement. (laughs) It's like we just don't recognize and remember, you know, who we are in God. And I think, and I'll just, I said at the first service, I'll say it in this one too. I think that the the institutional church is, is at a point of discouragement sometimes and struggle because our focus is in the wrong area. We are focusing on institutional church and buildings and trying to survive instead of focusing ourselves where Jesus has asked us to, the advancement of the kingdom of God and sharing Jesus with the world. Anybody maybe feel that way too? I think that's exactly what it is. We're so worried about trying to save a building or, or, a, or a, an institution when Jesus says, I could care less about that. I want you to go share me and go carry out kingdom of God activity. It's powerful. But I want us to see this. <clears throat> when, we, when we get involved in church and ministry and our calling, it's going to have imperfections. You know why? Because we are imperfect people. God has no other choice but to call and invite broken people to carry out his purpose and his plan because we're all broken in some areas. We do things that sinners do. We hurt people. We hurt one another, whether it's intentional or unintentional. We do it. We do stupid things, and that's how it is. But this is where love and grace and mercy and that idea of community become so powerful that we cannot divorce ourselves from the church or from our ministry or from, from uh, even our, our calling because of problems or disappointments or being disillusioned. And this is my encouragement for us, and this is where I want us to go. Uh, and, and these final two quotes here. Galatians 6 that we already read. Do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap if you do not give up a great harvest. So let us do good to everyone, especially those in the house of God. Also, Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, everything that hinders us and keeps us from running this race, and let us run this race with endurance that has been set before us. And it's an encouragement for us to move forward and to step into what God has for us. So we have five pitfalls that could keep us from stepping into where God wants us to be. Which one of these is holding you back? Which one of these do you need to work on? Where's God speaking to you today? And could we just simply say, here I am, Lord. 
I'm ready to go.